Well, as I'm sure you're all aware, typewriters are complicated machines. They're specialty machines, and you might assume that might mean you need expensive specialty tools, and you do for most things. Um, I'm certain you could probably get away with not doing a lot of the things that you need specialty tools for. So I'm here to kind of give you the lay of the land as far as really basic toolkits that can just get you off on the start of your typewriter repairing journey. Um, if at any point you would like to rudely interrupt and ask a question, be my guest, and you are welcome to come and go whenever you please. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been many instances when I was just starting out with repair, when I sat down to work on a project only to discover that I did not have the necessary tools. And I did what anyone else might have done, which is absolutely nothing. But that's all about to change. My goal here today is to acquaint you with a variety of affordable, available, and multi-purpose tools to get you underway. And if you're curious about my credentials, then I can assure you that I have at least once personally successfully fix the typewriter without adult supervision. I'm going to go, I'm going to do my best to sort through a vast array of tools and share with you what I have experienced to be the absolute necessities of typewriter repair. Now we're on a time limit. I've got a lot to get through. Um, these tools are to help you take down a machine, repair mechanical issues and put them together again, preferably in a working manner. I know some, some people might dispute that, but I prefer my machines to work after I've taken them apart. So that's about it. We're gonna break this down into three major categories with basic tools, more advanced tools, and then kind of specialty tools or like the super advanced stuff. So we're gonna jump right in and start by building a foundational typewriter toolkit with the absolute bare necessities. The first category of course is getting started in basic repair. So I'm going to attempt to switch over my camera to show you on my desk. I thought a PowerPoint presentation was a little bit lackluster. So I think I'm just going to shut off my little VHS camcorder up here and flip on over to something else. Um, one second. And okay, let's, let's plug this in. Okay, you should all be able to see my desk here. And can you all hear me still? Yes, we can, and we can okay, see. Okay, that's, that's excellent. So we're going to first begin with the most important typewriter tool of all time. It's a screwdriver. Now, if you've ever tried to work on a typewriter, you'll know that they all contain a lot of screws. Now, there are two major types of typewriters. Can you still hear me? Notice yes, the camera can. just shut up. Yep. Okay, great. So there are carpenters, screwdrivers, and then there are hollow ground screwdrivers. Now, most people haven't really identified a difference between the two, but if you look at the side profile of a carpenter's screwdriver, you'll see that it comes to a point. And what actually happens when you use these for fine machine screws is the point will cause it to slip out of the channel and give you what we call cam out screws. Now, what happens with a nice hollow ground bit is that these bits will actually grip the sides of the screw channels and give you the maximum transference of mechanical energy so that you avoid screw slippage and cam out. Now, what cam out essentially is, is the movement of metal within the screw channel that essentially just looks really bad and you can end up destroying or stripping the screw permanently. That is something that we all want to avoid. Now, a great start with these hollow ground sets or what a lot of people would call gunsmith screwdrivers is the Chapman tool set. Now this is the typewriter tool set specifically made by Chapman. It's the 0623 set. And that is actually the date of the International Typewriter Day, June 23rd. And this set was put together by Garrett Lay, um, who as we know, passed away a year or two ago. He was the mastermind behind the set, cataloged every single measurement of screw heads known to man and put together a set that basically completely covers every single screw that you could encounter in a typewriter, including the Phillips head drivers for the later machines, like the Underwood Olivetti's that use Phillips heads to attach those bodies together. Now, the great thing about this set is it is a bit set that is completely interchangeable and you can stick them all inside your screwdriver and have access to all of your screwdrivers within one handle. It's an excellent set, it's fully swappable, but there are two problems that I've noticed with it. The first problem is this really large collar on the front of the bits, and that makes it difficult to get your screwdriver into small spaces, like say the ends of platen knobs. The other thing to notice is that these screws, screwdrivers are not magnetic. 
Now, Chapman says that they don't want magnetic screwdrivers because they don't want to interfere with electronics work. So I would recommend having yourself two additional screwdrivers. Now, these don't have to be hollow ground, but you do need a long reach screwdriver and a uh, magnetized screwdriver. Now, these long reach screwdrivers are great for things like the front plate on the Quiet Deluxe, where you need to get inside the left side underneath that touch control. And magnetic screwdriver heads are really great for small screws and small holes, like the Smith Corona panels or the escapement brackets on the torpedo. If you've ever taken one of those apart, you know that you need to stick the driver down inside a little hole with the screw attached to it. And you can't really do that with your fingers. They won't fit. And then you might get into one more type of screw, which are the ones with super, super thin slot channels. And I'm sure you've come across those a handful of times. And I have a bit of an unconventional tool that I like to use to get those out. This is a tempered stainless steel ruler. Now, it seems a little bit odd. So let me give you a demonstration on what I might use that for. So you should have some screws. Now, if we have a slotted screw, let's say like this one, and it is stuck inside the machine, you can actually take the end of the ruler and put it into the head. And you can do that in a variety of orientations, and that will give you more leverage than a normal screwdriver would. And it also allows you to get into a, a thinner slot than the Chapman sets will allow you to. Well, the smallest bit on the Chapman sets is this one here, and I believe that is the number 88 bit, and it breaks very easily. Now, that's the great thing. You break the bit before you break the screw, but you don't really want to break anything because you're supposed to be fixing stuff. So the ruler is a really great way to get out some of those really, really stuck screws. You might also want to consider a set of micro drivers. Now, these are generally for eyeglasses or for really small electronics pieces, but sometimes it's good to get into their little spot and prior parts and pieces or things like that. So that's screwdrivers. I would say that the second most important tool that you could possibly have are spring hooks. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard of spring hooks. I don't know if anybody has seen them or found them. You can see that there is just a very tiny hook on the end there. Basically, they're used to attach springs. They're pretty self-explanatory. And there are two types. There are push hooks and there are pull hooks. Now, this one is a pull hook. It's a bit of a larger one. You can see that hook there. And if I can pull out a little bit of a spring to demo that, so I have all my parts organized in these nice little trays, but they're not labeled, so I can't find anything. So let's just grab a really nice big one for a demo. Now, when you have a spring inside of a machine, you will use a pull hook to grab the end of the loop and stretch it and attach it to a place you need. But sometimes that spring is in a different orientation facing away from you, and in which case you will have a push hook. A push hook allows you to get behind it and push it away from you into a position. Um, sometimes they'll look a little bit different. Uh, they might look a little bit more like this, which is a squiggly line. This end will actually both pull the hook, and if you needed it to, it can push the hook as well. These are very, very handy tools to have and a must-have tool. But if you only had one spring hook, I would recommend a pull one that is extra long. This is a snack fixture for an embroidery set, and these will be used to pull the draw bands through the machine. You now you'll have one end attaching to the mainspring drum, and then you'll have to pull that way underneath the carriage to the left end, and it's super beneficial to have an extra long uh, spring hook for that. And I can Further break down spring hooks into one more category with grab hooks. These ones are spring loaded and will actually, it's hard to see on the camera, grab what you're, what you're uh, hooking on there and it'll hang on to it for you. So you don't have to worry about it falling off. These are really hard to come by, but they are handy. So if you do happen to find one, I'd recommend picking it up. Now we get into another rather conventional tool, um, pair of pliers. Now these are standard needle nose pliers and there are 90 degree pliers. Now I would say I use these way more than the standard needle nose pliers. Um, I don't recommend bending these yourself because heating them up to get the metal pliable will just ruin the temper. So if you can find 90 degree pliers or these are more than 45, that's super helpful. Um, there's also wire cutters. Now, these are really just a cheap pair of wire cutters. Um, you would use these to modify links in your machine, or what I use them mainly for is modifying springs inside of the machine. 
Now, I kind of lost the spring that I just put down, so I'll grab another one. Oh, there's a little bit of a trick in the repair books. If you have a spring that has lost its tension and you want to tighten up those coils, what a lot of people will actually do is take their wire clippers and cut the head off of that spring. And it sounds a little bit sacrilegious, but if you do it the right way, it can actually help you out a lot. But you might come into a little bit of a problem now that you have a headless spring. You will use the same tool, the wire cutters, to actually bend up another loop. You want to stick the edge of the blade underneath that first loop and then just pry it up and, and get a second one there. So it's kind of a multi-purpose tool and it's a very handy thing to have around. Um, I would say that the 90 degree pliers are very useful for things like holding the tiny bolts inside of the Royal Model P body panels. If you know right at the back end of the carriage are these tiny little bolts that you need to screw into. And sometimes you can't get your fingers in there or even a wrench to hold those in. And these types of pliers come in really handy. These are a further type of pliers we can look into such as uh, parallel draw pliers, which are good for bending pieces, and a really much larger cutter. Sometimes these small wire snippers don't cut the pieces that you need to, and you might have a really thick piece of linkage or something that you need to shear through, and something that's a lot more heavy duty will help with that. But anything of that nature should work just fine. All right, so the next set, well, let's talk about um, a knife. I think that is more of a basic thing. Maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So I think the next super helpful set of tools to acquire is a decent mechanics wrench set. Now, I, I, I specifically mean decent. These are stamped metal wrenches and you can bend them pretty easily and they don't really help you out a whole lot. So what I would recommend is finding the really nice cast ones. They're nice and solid and they do the job well. You don't have to worry about the jaws of the wrenches bending as you undo some of those stiff bolts. But in relation to wrenches, I highly, highly recommend socket screwdrivers. And I have my most used one here. I don't know if people have seen these before, but it is a fixed hex screwdriver. And this one is sized specifically for the Royal Model P's or all Royal portables on the lock nut for the shift adjustments. So getting a couple of these for the shift adjustments would be really helpful. The size of the nuts on the Royals are the same exact size for, um, I believe, Smith Coronas and Remington. So you get a really great tool out of just one. But we can also bring back talking about the Chapman typewriter tool set. Now, in addition to the screwdriver you get, there's also this, what they like to call the mini ratchet. And I think this is super handy for getting into really tight spots. Um, this is a standard quarter inch socket. It is not reversible. You just flip it around to the other side if you want to tighten your knot. And it allows you to get into really tiny angled spots. And you can attach a socket driver to that as well. All right, so I would say that the next tool that would complement your basic kit is something that I would have to credit Duane Jensen for. And his enlightening tips are never ending. That would be a pair of forceps. You know, we like to talk about fixing typewriters as akin to doing surgery. And sometimes it really is. These are a bit heavy duty. So I do have a smaller pair line around here, but I can't seem to find them at the moment. But there's a difference between forceps and tweezers. Tweezers can be a little bit more precise, but forceps lock in and give you a further reach with better mechanical advantage. And these are great for reaching into small cavities in machines and manipulating tiny parts especially in the IBM Selectrics. If you've seen any of Dwayne's videos, you know that he uses these a lot to attach some of those really small parts and they're super handy. Now, you may also want to bend one of these 90 degrees. I haven't had to do that, but if you do, always heat your metal before you bend it. And that leads me into a heat source. It is a great idea to have something to give off heat, like a blow torch. Um, there are alcohol torches. And actually, if I can get up for a second, I do have one. Should have pulled that out before. This is a 1920s alcohol burner. It you has a wick on the one container on this side that you light, and it heats up the nozzle of the torch and causes a negative pressure zone to jet the alcohol from the second reservoir out into a little flame. And they're very handy 
Um, these ones are not very wind resistant, but there are small handheld butane and propane torches that can help with a variety of things from soldering, brazing, and even shrink tubing for some methods of repairing feed rollers. I have a very small one that I like to use for many of my feed rollers. This is a small butane um, cigarette lighter, but it is wind resistant, so it creates a very hot jet. And this one actually makes three jets, so it's really overpowered and kind of scary. Gets a little hot in the hands, but for small projects like the smallest type slug soldering, that stuff is really helpful to have. And we'll talk a little bit about type slug soldering momentarily. And next thing you would want is oil, obviously, um, or an oiler. Uh, the type of oil doesn't matter too much. I use clear 100% um, synthetic sewing machine oil. I have used antique sewing machine oil, but a needlepoint applicator is very, very handy to have. If you don't have a needlepoint applicator. I did have a little Smith Corona applicator, which I don't know where I put that at the moment, but Smith Corona, uh, along with their tool sets for the Corona 3 and Corona 4, gave you this little metal canister that had a point applicator to it. But if you don't happen to have anything like that, you can take one of these screwdrivers or the long reach screwdrivers and apply a dot of oil to the tip. And that surface tension of the oil will actually keep it on the screwdriver and allow you to place that in very delicate places. So there's you know thousands of different oil applicators out there. You don't really need them. You can just use the tip of a screwdriver. And two more things on here. We have a set of MIG pliers. I lost my MIG pliers, otherwise I'd show them to you. Not many typewriters need to be welded, but these pliers have cutouts that are fantastic for taking the rubber off of old feed rollers, especially when it is super hard and brittle. They're like the nutcrackers of the typewriter world. And then we have a strap wrench. I'm not sure if anybody has heard of strap wrenches before, but I will show you one of those right now. This is a friction-based wrench. You will loop it around something here, cinch it closed, and as you manipulate the handle, it will actually tighten up on that rubber strap. And these are great for removing things like platen knobs and platens for machines with a platen screw in, like the Olivetti's or the Olympia SG series. Sometimes those can get really stuck on there, and if you've ever tried to remove one, you know that you don't want to use any sort of pipe wrenches on the knobs because you'll destroy them. So strap wrenches are a great way to leverage those off without damaging any of the parts. Now, you also need a knife. So this is my knife. Now, I want to explain that you probably don't want a nice knife. We're not chefs, we're repair techs. I made my knife out of a 50 cent little yard sale find of a butter knife, and I use it for cutting rubber off of cores. You're going to abuse this a lot, so don't spend more than 50 cents. Um, a razor blade or a box cutter is going to be much too thin. You'll end up snapping those blades, but I do recommend a razor blade for trimming new rubber. So if you do the shrink tube method to repair feed rollers, you can just trim off the excess edges with a nice razor blade and save the nasty blade for carving off the old hardened rubber instead. Um, you also need a cheap flashlight. Nothing's, nothing fancy. Fancy flashlights are pointless. You're not illuminating the insides of an underground cavern or trying to shine a spot on the moon. You're just looking at levers and springs. I would stray away from the proprietary batteries and light bulbs. And if you use a thousand lumens, you'll blind yourself and set your machine on fire. So simple, easy to use, fine parts, never breaks. Uh, universal bulbs and batteries are good. This is my personal flashlight. This is a 2D cell EverReady that was made in 1910. You don't need anything that old, but this has one single moving part, so it will literally never, ever break. There is a lot of universal battery flashlights like this 2AA battery, which has a magnet on it, and that's very helpful for shining light into other places. You can use your phone, but your phone doesn't like to prop up and stay where you put it, so that's kind of a pain in the butt. Coming down to the last two in this basic repair kit, we have a marker. Now this one's pretty self-explanatory, but for the sake of the demonstration, allow me to show you the magic of a marker. So drum roll, please. There we go, it makes a mark. You'll find yourself using one of these for marking the orientation of parts you have removed, like back plates, align scales, or feed roller bays and stuff like that. You wanna make sure that those are properly oriented. Sharpies wash off easy with alcohol, but alcohol can ruin paint. So be careful of where you apply. And for the final thing on our list of a very basic toolkit is a hammer. Sounds a little bit unconventional and it looks really nasty, but I guarantee you these are used way more than you'd think. 
mostly for banging on things. If you have something that is bent or <laughs> something that is stuck, just give it a really good whack and it should come loose. Um, I will admit that I have personally used this on a Hammond to get a rusted and frozen turret off of it. I just smacked the bottom of it and it popped right off. Didn't damage anything. You can damage anything if you hit it hard enough with a hammer. So beware of the strength you apply to your tools. So we're going to move on a little bit. I think all of my papers got out of order. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about advanced repair work. Sometimes you need to improvise tools that either don't exist or are hard to come by. And I have kind of two more common examples of those. Let's see if I can pull out the big one. So I don't know if anybody knows what this is. This is actually the segment bearing rod of a Royal Portable typewriter. You might wonder why we need actual typewriter parts inside of a tool set. Well, this one is really great for removing individual type bars. Now you don't really want to yank the entire bearing rod out of the machine because then you'll have all of those little arms and type bars dangling. Instead, what we would use this for and what the Royal Factory recommended using one of these for is to insert it along with a existing bearing rod inside the edge of the machine. So you'd essentially have two of these inside your machine and you could manipulate the gap in the middle of those two around one of those type bars that you wanted to pull out. And that allows you to remove one bar and replace it without having to deal with organizing all of the rest of them. And then we have one more. Uh, I believe some of you may be familiar with this as I did a YouTube video on this tactic about a year ago. This applies to the ball bearings on Royal Portables and would work on the Smith Corona Portables and the flat top on work. I'm going to grab a spare set of ball bearings and demonstrate how I use a drinking straw. So the Royal and Smith Corona ball bearings are standard quarter inch bearings, but they have this special orbital gear that goes around them. If you've ever had to replace the bearings on this machine, you know how much of a pain in the butt that is to align, but the drinking straw makes that really easy. And all you need to do with that is cut yourself a nice clean tip off that straw and two slots on opposite ends. And what this essentially does is mimic the Royal proprietary tool used to install these ball bearings. It will not only perfectly hold the ball bearing, but it will also hold that orbital gear in the center nice and steady as you insert that into the machine. And it's a very cheap and easy solution that is honestly a lifesaver when it comes to reinstalling carriages on any of those more complicated machines. Now, I believe I got a little bit ahead of myself with some of these other tools on the list. So we're gonna drop right down to our really specialty tools. Everything else so far is, you know, in the realm of basic or advanced, and you can use those for a variety of jobs. Um, and you mean a good pencil is another thing to have. This is a carpenter's pencil, doesn't roll away, but if you don't want to make a permanent mark with the Sharpie, then you can use something that is easy to wash off. Now, when we get into specialty tools, there are a, a lot of them. There's hundreds of them, and, and some of them I don't even know what they are. Um, and if you don't know what they are, chances are you probably don't have to use it. It's kind of a need to know basis. But one of the really, really nice ones is underneath the category of part manipulation or part modification. It is the T bender. Um, this one's not really a T, but generally it'll just be a straight T shaped bar. This one has a fancy handle on it. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware that the technical term for bending a part is called forming. It makes it sound less aggressive. Um, there's a variety of tools that are designed to help with this. And the most readily available tool is your fingers. The most common of the, the actual tools is of course this T-bender and it has a slot in the tip. Now this slot is great for shortening the actuation distances of something like say a sublink for a type bar. Um, you would stick something, in for lack of a better example, I have this, one of these spring hooks. I don't wanna bend one, but if you did, you would put that T-bar across that link and give it a good twist and that will bend it up nice and tight for you. That's great for either shortening or lengthening the, the distances between bars. Now, other forms of benders include peening pliers, multi-drop pliers, wheel pliers, and these are for really, really thick pieces. Now, you use a T-bender for something that's relatively thin, like a wire linkage. 
This is a pair of nine jaw pliers. These are relatively hard to come by and these are great for bending type bars. Now, I'm just gonna grab a spare one to show that to you. Part of the lining type bars is getting them to go evenly through those guides and sometimes you need to bend them a little bit. What the nine jaw plier is, is allow you to use very gentle pressure. And if you use a lot of pressure, you can see that bends it quite a lot. That is great for fine adjustments. If you want to bend it back, you can just flip it around and straighten that up nicely. Now I mentioned peening pliers. These are peening pliers. I've never used them before. I assume I would never have to use them, but they're just small sets of angled jaw pliers that let you manipulate and stretch material in a very small area. Then we also have the wheeled benders. These are the more common types of tools you'll see, but I feel like they're the most useless. The idea of it is you would have a piece of metal that goes between those wheels and you would squeeze it and bend it, but I've never had to use them. And I think that if you did have to use a pair of pliers to bend something, the nine jar or the T bender would be the most useful. You might come across something that looks like this. These are not for modifying parts or manipulating anything. These are for installing ribbon eyelets. This is an eyelet tool and it has a small punch in the middle there that will secure those firmly in place. But I never use this either. You can accomplish the same exact purpose with a simple knot. So let's move on a little bit to something more unique um, as far as part modification. And that would be hand files. Um, I guess that's not particularly unique, but you gotta make these things sound interesting. It's clearing this stuff away here. I mean, I would like to say, I hope none of you have ever seen a file before, and now I can blow your mind, but we all know what files are. And a nice assortment of small files, cheap files is great. You can find them in, you know, old people's workshops. Um, the excellent thing about these, are, well, two main purposes really. And the first is to widen the gap inside of a type guide. Um, sometimes bending the bars doesn't really give you that option, and sometimes they're not adjustable. If you've used a woodstock typewriter, you'll notice that the type guide has two adjustable screws. Most machines don't have this, so sometimes you might need just to file that gap a little bit wider to allow those type bars to pass. You can also use them to file down the type bars themselves so they clear the anvil a little better, or really just for anything that you need to lightly modify. Files are a good controlled way to accomplish that. And they come in a lot of sizes too. This is a round file. You can use that for filing round things. Next up on the list are something a little more uncommon. And I don't say that just for flair. Really, they really are uncommon. Um, these are retainer clip pliers. Now you don't really come across retainer clips much on manual typewriters, but you do. These are for machines, later machines, specifically the IBMs and a good set of Allen keys and Bristol wrenches are good for that as well, but I'll catch up to that. But the Brothers, Wintax and all those, and even some manuals like the console typewriters. Now the console has a retainer clip that holds in the feed rollers. Those tend to be super brittle, so care is needed to remove them, but a good set of retainer pliers and spare C and E clips are great to have on hand. Now, as you can see, when you squeeze these, these actually widen two pegs and those will fit into the peg holes on your retainer clip and split them apart so you can easily remove them or install them. And a lot of them will have an adjustable thumb screw so you don't spread it too far and end up damaging that peg. This one does not have a thumb screw, so you would want to be careful using something like that. And this one is actually opposite. This one, when you squeeze it, it closes versus opens. Um, that one is used for different types of retaining clips. It's a little bit less common. One that opens up is probably the most widely used, especially on the IBM Selectrics. Now, if you're interested in working on the IBM Selectrics, then there is a whole host of tools you need. But the two most basic tools we'd start with are the Bristol wrenches and the hand crank. We'll set the hand crank aside for a moment and talk about Bristol wrenches. Now, these might look like standard Allen keys, and yes, you do need Allen keys for later machines, again, like the later Royals or the Underwood Olivetti's that have hex screws inside of the platen knobs. These are not hex screws. These are more of a Star of David type uh, cross section, and these are super specialty um, little drivers, and those are great for removing the Bristol lugs inside of the IBMs. 
Um, IBM uses a lot of these because they didn't want normal people servicing these machines. It had to be specialized techs only. So if you want to do any of that complicated stuff, you can take a look online and find yourself a nice Bristol wrench set. Coming to the hand crank, this is the number one tool you'll need to service an, an IBM Selectric. Um, you can buy these newly manufactured like this one off of eBay for a darn good price, and they thread into the end of the operational camshaft and allow you to slowly manipulate the machine as you work. Now, you can imagine that this would be inside the IBM with the less shift arbor on the side there, and you can manipulate the crank to slowly go through the motions of the machine. You don't want to be sticking your hands into a, an IBM that is powered by its electric motor because it will rip your fingers off. So just a light, light little turn for these little cranks is super helpful to have. And this is absolutely essential for any IBM tool job. And then moving on to the very, very specialized tools, we're going to talk about the solder guide, which I hinted at before. This is a type slug solder jig. Um, there's a variety of different types of solder jigs. There are some that you take the type bars out of the machine and install them onto the jig. And there are ones like this that actually clamp onto the type guide of the machine. Now this plate here is a type guide that I took off of a Royal Quiet Deluxe. And you can see that there's a plate there with a small notch on there. And that notch is actually going to align with the letters on the type slug. You will press that up onto the machine, line it up and have a spring hook closed down on it. And that will hold it in place and in alignment for you to resolder that slug completely. Now, a couple of years ago, I did a Royal Model P from 1927 that I completely resoldered into a script typeface, and I did that all by hand. One of these would have been greatly helpful. Uh, basically, you know, just put that on there. These aren't tools that you'll find generally. They're very specialized tools. They're very hard to come by, and you'll need to use something like this one that bolts on with the platen or the entire carriage removed. Kind of related to those are key ring remover pliers, which I don't own. You can live without them, but man, do they make the job of removing key rings a lot easier. Uh, you don't have to deal with bending up those tabs or anything. If I had them, I'd show them, but they're like 400 bucks a set. And that's kind of out of reach for most typewriter repair jobs. You don't really need to remove the key tops. That's a cosmetic thing. As for the last general tool on my list, I would suggest a working multimeter. Now, this is my multimeter. It's a little bit old, but it works super well. And you would use these primarily to check circuit components on very, very late electric typewriters. You'd mostly be using the ohm setting to verify that a current is passing between parts. And if there's no current passing, the part is damaged or broken. And that is about as technical as I get. So that marks pretty much the last tool on the long and hopefully complete list. I did, I don't know if I have time for some honorable mentions. You know, I don't know how much time is on the clock. Yeah, uh, we have about five minutes, so go for it. Okay, well, we'll just scoop into my top three. We have a center punch. Uh, you'll need a center punch for drilling holes into things. If you need to fabricate a new part, a center punch is a good way to make sure that your drill bit doesn't travel as you go. Um, we also have a dental mirror. That's nice for looking into small parts inside of a machine. And finally, a spring gauge. I don't really use this, I just kind of go by feel, but there are certain spring tensions that your carriage should be pulling on a desktop, it's about two pounds, and on a portable, maybe it's about one pound. And sometimes, until you get a feel for it, it's helpful to have a gauge. So time for some success stories. I have used these tools to fix typewriters. That's my success story. So there's the tour of varying degrees of relatively basic typewriter toolkits. Um, there are many, many typewriter designated tools out there for specialty purposes that I haven't touched on, and the majority of jobs you'll encounter will never really need to use those. So I hope you've all had a chance to enjoy yourself and maybe learn a thing or two, and I'd like to thank you all for joining me on this virtual hardware store adventure, and I will guess I'll open up the floor to anybody who might have questions before we stop, and as previously stated, you're welcome to stay or leave at any time, and thank you for making Virtual Hermans a smash hit. So if anybody has any brief questions, now's the time to open that up. I see the chat has gone on to 99, but I haven't had it open. So no, I've been I've been checking it out and there's a few questions there, Lucas. Thank you so much for that. That's unbelievable oh. information. Um, we've all been uh, kind of answering most of the questions as we as we went uh, in the chat there. Uh, Gear had a question earlier. What's a great, uh, a good quality brand for strap wrenches? Because he's had it um, a good bad quality experiences. brand. 
anything that's cheap, um, I guess the rule of thumb that I go by is if I buy a cheap tool and I use it enough that it breaks, then I can justify buying a more expensive tool. Um, I don't know what brand these strap wrenches I have are. They're just something that I found. Oh, it's literally just called grip wrench. But yeah, just something that I found lying around and had use for. Got it. That's good. Thank you. And another question uh, that Diane asks, is there anything for pre-20s machines, those older machines that you find uh, specific or invaluable? Anything that I've discussed in the basic section really applies to every single machine that I've ever done. Anything from the 1890s all the way up until the 1980s. Um, all typewriters generally have flathead screws, and you would like a nice flathead screwdriver set like the Chapman set to work with those. The Chapman set is really invalu invaluable for those older machines because you don't risk damaging the screws. You do not want to damage screws on a really old machine, and that's probably the biggest thing. That's great. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? You're welcome to unmute your microphone. We've got just a few minutes left on the session. I just wanted to say hello to everyone. Mr. Drury, Nick Jacobs here in Connecticut, just signed on. Thank you for the information. No problem. I do see somebody see on air compressors. Yes, air compressors are great. I have a really cheap Makita one. It's two gallons, and that's great for blowing junk out of a machine. But I'm not really here to cover cleaning, mostly just repair. I do have a slight question about screws. Do you know whether or not there are, like, the threads on them, on the old ones, do they follow standards that are repeatable today? Could you potentially get, like, a tool to make new threads on old screws? Absolutely. Depends on where you get your machine from. Um, most machines are imperial threaded, and the United States used imperial up until the 1940s or 50s, but most machines afterwards used metric. And if you get European machines, they're most likely going to be metric. Cool, thanks. Somebody Hi. raised their hand there. Did somebody, was somebody hey. about to ask a question? I'll go for it, Luke. Uh, Luke Lucas, uh, yes. do you find a tendency that uh, this, uh, the, the motor drum fixing screw, um, some of them there are right-hand thread, some of them are left-hand left, left -hand thread. I find that uh, uh, from my experience that uh, European ones, or uh, non-American ones tends to be a uh, left-hand thread. However, um, maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong. So I wonder if you uh, have found any tendency on that. Uh, no specific pattern. I have noticed that some are left-handed and it depends on which direction the spring is applying tension to the center shaft. Um, sometimes having it reverse threaded will help keep it tight but it really doesn't affect anything as far as tools. We're about to leave this session and I'll be kicked yeah. out to go to the main session. Let me ask you real quick, Lucas, what are your three Desert Island tools? You can only bring three with you. What are they? Well, I'd obviously need a typewriter to work on, a set of screwdrivers, uh, pliers, and a spring hook. Perfect, I love it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you again, Lucas. We're all very grateful for your knowledge and going through that exhaustive list of tools. Much appreciated, man.